not everybody who is going to greet him with peace to you. Um, I'd just like to say in the beginning, I, I really was expecting a, a bigger turnout than this, so I'm really disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I'll know not to come to Cardiff again next time. Myself and Chris and Omar have been touring around the United Kingdom for the past uh, several weeks, speaking about uh, the effect of Guantanamo Bay, two sides, one story. <coughs> the one story, of course, is Guantanamo Bay, the world's most notorious prison, that even today as we speak is headline news. And our experience as, as prisoners, as those people held there behind the wire, but what was unique about this tour, what's historic about this tour, is that it's being done for the first time with somebody who's on, the, on, on what's regarded as the opposite side, the other side. And that's with Chris Arendt, who is a, um, is a brave man. He's a brave man for doing what he's doing at a time like this. And having done so before Obama ever said that he was going to close Guantanamo, which he said when he was first, when he was inaugurated as president. But... I just want to, to tell you something about how with the movements that are taking place around the world, whether it's to do with Gaza, whether it's to do with Iraq or Afghanistan, the detentions process and attitudes of countries, something that I learned in my little self in 2004 in solitary confinement in Camp Echo maximum security isolation block. I'd been held there for a couple of years and had been detained by the Americans well, after I'd been um, kidnapped from my house in Pakistan, where I had lived and was living with my wife and children after we had evacuated from Afghanistan, where we'd built a project, we'd done a project to build a school for girls in Afghanistan run by the Taliban. Not, not the schools, I guess, <coughs> Afghanistan was run by the Taliban. <laughs> and we evacuated under these uh, cruise missiles by the Americans and cluster bombs and carpet bombs and phosphorus bombs, and vacuum bombs and smart bombs and bombs I can't even pronounce the names of. <coughs> and we made it to Pakistan. It was there in the middle of the night, midnight precisely, on the day of the 31st of January 2002. Somebody knocked my door and I opened it and somebody put a gun right to my head. And pushed me into the four walls of my house and made me kneel down with the gun to my head and shackled my hands behind my back and shackled my legs and put a hood over my head and then in the prone position carried me off in front of my family, away for the next three years, never to see them again. And after a process of being held in several detention sites, which included the Bagram detention facility, Kandahar detention facilities, and ultimately Guantanamo, I was put in maximum security, solitary confinement, isolation, camp echo. And it was there in 2004 where an American soldier came over after uh, um, the change of duty or the rotor shift. And this soldier was an enigma. He was a strange character because he had served two tours of duty in Vietnam as a volunteer, not as a draftee, as a volunteer. He must have been over 60. And I thought, my goodness, the army is desperate because they pulled this guy back out of retirement. And they were, of course, des desperate. But he gave me the first real ray of hope that I ever could have imagined. And do you know what that was? He told me that millions of people had marched on the streets of Britain. Millions of people had marched on the streets of London, the streets I know fairly well, against the war. And up until this point, I had really believed that my government and I think that was true even, to that, even today, had abandoned me. But more importantly, I thought the people of this country had also. I thought, you know, I'm just another brown-skinned son of immigrants. Why should they care about me? Let him rot in prison. Let his family wait for years on. Let his children not know what it's like to have a father. Let his child be born and not have his father present for the next few years. That's what I thought. But then I heard of the movement and it wasn't called the Stop the War movement. It wasn't called any movement. It was simply called millions of people were marching in the streets of Britain. And that came to me in my cell. It had its effect for those people who feel that it didn't stop the war in Iraq. It didn't stop the war in Afghanistan. It didn't stop the war mothers. For me, I can say, its ripple effects reached me in my tiny little cell 
on a 45 square mile patch of American rented soil that they've taken from the Cubans. And the person who told me about it, that was the important part. Because this man was no tree hugger by any stretch of the imagination. He was somebody that would be regarded as a good old boy. He was a Republican. He loved carrying weapons. He loved talking about his constitutional right to carry and bear arms. And of course, for, for me, he was the epitome of what I thought was an American soldier, only just a bit older. And my experience there with many of the soldiers was, was a paradox. Sometimes, and many soldiers, talk, several soldiers said this to me, that to keep a man down, you have to stay with him. You want to keep somebody down, you've got to stay on top of him. Just imagine a, a judo hold or a jiu-jitsu hold. For as long as you stay down with that person, they will remain subdued. But the moment you get up, they will get up with you. And this was the sentiment of some of the soldiers. And I wrote a book when I returned, and I spoke about the process of what it's like to be a Muslim growing up in, the, in, the, in Britain in the 70s and the 80s, and uh, what it's like to be an Asian, what it's like to be British, and have all of these uh, confusing ideals of identity and so forth. And then, of course, I talked about my journey, the journeys around the world, and ultimately what was it that led to my imprisonment and incarceration in the world's most notorious prison. But I didn't want to just tell my story. I wanted to tell the story also of people on the other side. And one of the things I've often been accused of is that I, I, I'm told that I'm too kind towards my captors. But in the interest of justice, it simply means, in my estimation, it's just a question of being truthful. That's all. There's no need to exaggerate. The truth is harsh. The truth is uh, odd and strange enough. It's hard enough to see your compatriots or your co-detainees being beaten to death. It's hard enough to hear the sounds of a woman screaming next door in a cell that you're made to believe is your wife being tortured. It's hard enough to have to, have to undergo the process of being initiated into US custody, which includes being dragged through the mud with your hands tied behind your back and your legs shackled with a stifling hood over your head and a marine pulling your head across. It's hard enough to be stripped, stripped naked with a knife slicing your clothes across your back that you can feel the cold steel gliding against your skin. It's hard enough being punched and spat at and kicked and shaved so that if you were to look in the mirror, you couldn't even recognize yourself. It's hard enough to watch that happen to other men and remain silent because of fear, impotency. And those are all the truths that every detainee, every person that was ever detained in Guantanamo <coughs> will tell you that they went through. It's too concurrent and recurrent for it to be a story concocted by hundreds of people from different countries, 47 different countries. They couldn't have all made it up, especially now because interrogators and soldiers and people who were there on the other side have confirmed what's taking place. So that's why I, want, I thought it was important for people to hear the other side of the story, but also because to learn about where is it that we in this country, we in the United States of America, are taking our soldiers from what background, what origin, what state of mind, and what are we making them do? And what are we turning them into? Today, as you may know, Guantanamo Bay is being spoken of, particularly in the case of the man called Binyam Mahmoud, <coughs> who's been detained in Guantanamo for seven years. He's a British resident, and we believe he'll be released within weeks, if not days. But why is it headline news today? Why is the BBC constantly updating its website, updating its news in relation to this case. Is it because they care about Binyam? They care about this son of Ethiopian immigrants who lived in Britain and was detained in Pakistan and was extraordinarily rendered from there by the Americans to Morocco 
where, amongst other things, they took a razor blade to his genitalia to torture him and then sent him to Guantanamo where he lost his mind. Is it because they care about him? Is that the nature of the war on terror? Is that what we, we've so far seen in relation to the treatment of prisoners and attitudes amongst ordinary people, amongst the media and amongst politicians? Is that it? No. It's because after the lawyers put through the case of Bin Yan Muhammad and the issues regarding his detention and the complicity of the British government and intelligence agencies in his torture was, gonna, was going to come to light, the Americans threatened. The Americans threatened the British and said, if you let this information come to light, we will stop cooperating with you. We will stop cooperating with you in intelligence-related matters. So there goes the special relationship between Britain and America. That's why it is huge news today. That's why. Not because they care about the individual, Binyam Muhammad, or any of the others. Now, I'm not going to speak too much more uh, about uh, my experiences of Guantanamo. Rather, I, I detailed all of that in a book that I've written that you can get <coughs> back um, later on. And I do urge you to buy that thing. But, uh, if you don't, I'll send the boys around. Um, <laughs> but what I will do after I introduce... The, the next speaker, who's Umar Dagayas, who served in Guantanamo Bay as a detainee for six years and was released in 2007, is that myself and Chris will uh, converse about our time in Guantanamo Bay and about uh, our reactions to this tour. Today is the last day of the tour. So we are privileged, and I think you are, are privileged in a sense, for having at least Chris over here um, to speak about these issues. And we feel extremely privileged, to be honest, uh, not least because of this um, meager turnout that we've seen. Uh, and we are actually, I, I'm quite taken aback, to be honest. I, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated and I'm really happy to see such a huge turnout of people. It is a, a fitting uh, close to our tour, uh, and I really hope that we can give you something and you can take something from us by the end of it. Uh, and I'll now pass you over to Omar. Thank you. First, I would like to say, like my friend, thank you very much for, for your turnout and coming here in this large number. Secondly, also, to thank those of you who worked so hard and campaigned so hard when we were locked up in Guantanamo <laughs> Bay for our release and for the closure and still campaigning, are still campaigning for closure of that international torture place that is called Guantanamo Bay and many, many other detaining, detention places, secret places which are even worse, a lot worse than Guantanamo Bay. Those places like those places in Bagram, in Bagra, places in Kandahar where we went to and the torture there like anyone who was, like Muallam will tell you, or anyone who went through those kind of bases will tell you that, that you're subjected to the treatment there is a lot, lot worse than what goes on in Guantanamo. And there are many, there are many, many like those in Bagram and Kandahar. There are some in Jordan, in Jaffa, which is run and supervised and uh, overlooked by the CIA and run by the CIA. And only 10 detainees are there, top security 10 detainees are there. And those who guard this place and go have permission to access to that place are those who are cleared by the CIA and there are certain officials designated and are able to enter those places. Others, like we heard, Binyam was subjected to in Morocco, which is run by the CIA again, run for the CIA. Some in Pakistan, where we were first abducted and tortured in Pakistan. And there's, today, there's more than 20 in Pakistan, run by the CIA, not Pakistan. Uh, without the Pakistani ones which are the government run already but these are run for the CIA supervised by CIA there are more than 20 or about 20 uh, to do with uh, the war against terror there are some in, in Poland some in Romania, in Thailand in, in, the, in, in the island which is governed by the British the San Garcias uh, in Indian Ocean, an island in the Indian Ocean where there is a base where people are subjected to torture. Ladies and gentlemen, what I would like to say tonight is to speak to you about how it feels, just to speak about how it feels to be inside those barbed wires. I mentioned some of the things 
that you'd be subjected to if you were locked up in Guantanamo Bay. People who are in Guantanamo Bay, you, 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 you wake up to the possibility of death. People have died in Guantanamo Bay. More than four people that I witnessed died. Yasir and Ali Saleh and the man al and the Amri. Uh, five detainees we witnessed who died inside Guantanamo Bay from the treatment of Guantanamo Bay. There are others that, uh, that uh, died in Bagram that uh, Mozambique has witnessed. The others in Khost detention center, where other friend of mine has witnessed, and so on. There are more than 100, according to Thomas Friedman of the New York Times, there are more than 100 who died in detention centers throughout detention centers, according to the New York Times writer. And he says, all these hundreds, the U.S. claimed that they had died from heart attack. He said, heart attack, this is not only immoral, this is not only politically stupid, but also gravely immoral. This is, uh, there is a, a, a videotape which speaks about a man who, who Marvin witnessed, who, who taxi to the dark side, who many of you might have seen, a documentary speaking about a person who was a taxi driver in Afghanistan and then he was uh, brought to Bagram base and tortured there, beaten until he died. Uh, him and other three or four. And the man who did this, the guards who did this, they have interviews in this documentary which uh, had an Oscar because of how good the documentary was. They, these people who, the guards who did this act, not only that, they, instead of being reprimanded or being disciplined or something like that, what happened to him is that he went and elevated, they ranked him to become an interrogator. And then went on to do the same thing to Abu Ghraib prison, where he tortured people and sexually abused female uh, uh, prisoners in, in Iran. The same happened with the general, because some people might think that these are just individuals acting from their own, from their own will or, or from their own uh, overzealous performance or something like that. But knowing what that, that, that Bush himself and Dick Cheney and the, the Minister of Defense have signed papers to legalize torture, which does not, as long as it, they say it as, as, the, as the stretch of imagination, as long as that torture doesn't cause death or loss of organs or loss of, uh, of parts of the human being, then this is lawful inside the tunnel. They signed to those papers and this is now, this is public and uh, a man by the name of Wilkerson who worked in their offices have said this in public and noted which notes they, they signed. This is a public knowledge. The general himself Miller, General Miller, who used to work in Guantanamo Bay, one of the worst generals, as Chris would tell you, even for the guards. He used to remind them all the time when they came into cells with an attack like uh, James, James East wrote in his book, one officer who was in Guantanamo Bay wrote. He used to go around and remind them before they go to the cells, don't forget September 11. These are the people who committed September 11. Even though that most of those people in Guantanamo Bay were never picked up from anywhere like New York, anywhere in the, in, in the United States. Most of them were picked up from Gambia, from Bosnia, as far as Bosnia, Gambia, Indonesia, uh, Africa, some places in Europe, and so on. This man, the General Miller, was ranked, moved from what he did. He was taken, uh, to, he, the, he was, uh, the work he did, the, the, the awful uh, actions that he committed in Guantanamo Bay, he was to be moved afterwards because they thought he was successful into subjugating, subjugating people to humiliation, breaking many people down. Many people lost their minds. Many people, they have a big block. Chris will tell you about it. A large block which contains 50 cells that is filled with people, detainees there, who've lost their mind. People who have gone crazy inside the detention camp are moved to this block, an echo block, where everyone there it is very badly in need of, uh, of, uh, of care. This man was moved to Abu Ghraib, and he was, uh, he used to go around in Abu Ghraib and he used to say, we must autonomize Abu Ghraib prison. And this is how, how things were moving from upwards to downwards, not the opposite. It was not an action of individuals, but rather it was a system, a system of, uh, of this kind of <coughs> barbaric act and criminal offenses. People who live in Guantanamo Bay are subjected to, they could wake up to, to loss of limbs. Some people were tortured and beaten up so badly that they lost their eyes, lost their sights. Many like Ershia, like detainee 727, like another detainee, Algerian detainee. There are many who've lost 
parts of their, they were, their, sorry, their legs were amputated. He needed an operation, since an operation for his leg, and they amputated their leg. Because the doctors used to say to people who were in prison there that our job is not to help you, it's not to give you any cure. If you have any pain, any wounds, the most we can do for you is to amputate your leg, amputate your hand, amputate. There is no cure. We can give you painkillers if you want, we can give you drugs if you want, and they give people drugs, and some people became addicted to those drugs, and then used and subjected to, the, to uh, interrogation. But they say, if you want more drugs, speak to your interrogator and things like that. The doctors worked close, hand in hand, with interrogators. The doctors in Guantanamo Bay left their mission and message, which is a message of mercy, to work with interrogators into subjecting people to torture and using their profession to cause more harm and pain to, to detainees. And if you needed any help, they'd say to you, ask your interrogators, and we can only help you then, if, you're, if you cooperate, as they call it, with your interrogators. You could lose, as I say, limbs like Imran al taifi like Abu Abdurrahman al Musli. You could lose hands or eyes, like they were... The, uh, you could be subjected to deprivation of sleep. Uh, you can be, be drowned by water or be uh, used, water drowning is used against you to, so, you can, so you would stop resisting as they call it. Or psychiatric <coughs> torture that are more, 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 worse, more worse than the physical torture. The, psychiat the psychiatric torture that was used in Guantanamo Bay would last with many, many those who were imprisoned there for their lives. The way they used them, how they used the letters family letters, how they used many, many things, sexual abuse, racism, hunger, nudity, people were forced to be nude, overflow of toilets, sometimes you're in a cell, an overflow of toilets, you have to live with the overflow of toilets, floodlights for 24 hours, for six years. If you imagine a small cell with floodlights and you have to live inside that, day and night, within that glaring lights. For six years, sometimes some of the people who are there now for seven years. This is the seventh year. It means personal search twice every day. <laughs> Harassment. Possibility every day of five guards coming into your cell and beating you up. Maybe breaking your nose, ribs, and fingers, and arms, as, I have, as they have done to myself. Worms in your food. Your words that you say in interrogation are twisted against you and used against you. There are no laws, a land of no laws, where the laws are the whims of uh, interrogators and guards, simple guards, not even officers, ranking officers. Endless new rules that make no sense other than intimidate and humiliate uh, people in prison time. Attacks on your religion and your beliefs drag again and again for one session after another to inter be interrogated in darkness, in night, in day. You don't know whenever they knock on your doors and they tell you to get ready for interrogation. You're dragged to be interrogated by different sorts of all sorts of agencies. The CIA, the FBI, the SEDE, the intelligence, the military intelligence, the MI5, the MI6, the French interrogated us there. The Spanish interrogated some people there. The Italian interrogated people there. The Libyans interrogated people there. The Moroccans, the Tunisians, the Italian, everyone, everyone made use of Guantanamo Bay. Fraud and embezzlement went on. Every time the guards, every time a patch of guard recognizes that these people are human beings and that, that what they were told about them, about they, they were the people who, who uh, who committed September 11, just when they realize, just when they realize that all this is false and untrue because they come to speak to many detainees, they are moved and another new patch of guards are brought in. Embezzlement and fraud. Dick Cheney's company in Guantanamo Bay, like Chris will tell you, from the other side of the barbed wire, has been working there again and again. 60 million for just one prison, Camp 5, which is a block of concrete. There's nothing other than block of concrete. And another other ventures and other ventures. Since the Guantanamo was open, they never Halliburton, a 
company of Dick Cheney has never left that place. Some of the things that come to us come from Houston, Texas, the food. Obviously, you might, uh, you, you would be recognized, but who does that? Subjected to humiliation, photographed, stand to the wall, finger stamped, a nice, uh, exposed to all forms of humiliation and cruelty, reduced to a number, chained to the ground, chained sometimes in a stressed position, hanged sometimes from your hands, uh, chained, uh, subjected to all sorts of humiliation and degradation. All you say, even your whispers are listened to. They are listening devices, sound devices are listened to, and, and everything you say is listened to. Dirt in the food, in the water, and so on. This brings me to the last point which I wanted to mention, which is uh, that I promised the detainees there when I left that I will mention them every time I stand in person and speak about the time of Bay to bring attention to what is happening to them. Detainees there now in Guantanamo Bay today, as we speak, are in hunger strike. And this is maybe the fourth or fifth hunger strike. Most of them are under hunger strike, and most of them are very, in very bad critical conditions. Whom of Binyam Muhammad himself is, they said, he might, if he was ever released, like Muslims said, he might be released in coffins because of his really, really serious condition. Lately, the military lawyer has seen him, and she says that his condition is very, very bad. He's only bones and skin. And many, many people are under hunger strike. And when we hunger strike, some people there have been hunger striking now more than one to two years, and they were force-fed. Force-fed, if you imagine, is a tube pushed to your nose, going down to the throat, going down to the stomach. And, and then... You know, then some, some kind of liquid is put to, 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 to your stomach and this is done to you twice. And you can imagine the pain. Done without using any anesthetics because they want them to stop the hunger strike and the doctors use the hunger strike to torture people. And they pull it out, they pull the tube out so hardly it comes out of blood and pus and then they put it again, they put it in, down to another detainee's stomach without even cleaning it. And this is... This is the doctors who did that, not no one else, not the detainees, not, not the interrogators, not the guard. These are the doctors. That's why when Dr. Uh, David Nichols in Birmingham and another man, a lawyer, uh, Sullivan, pressurized them and, and, and spoke about this, this was a little bit reduced. Binyam Muhammad is a very nice young man, I know, a humorous young man, spirited, very good spirit. He used to help others in, in Guantanamo Bay to lift their spirits. But now he is, as I say, in a critical condition. He is presently on hunger strike, like many, many others are, and remains in solitary confinement. His mental and physical condition is of great concern. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you do continue the campaign to release all other prisoners. whose eye was poked out so that he couldn't see anymore. Omar is detainee 727. Um, before we start, I just want to introduce Chris to you. Chris is, um, uh, his name is Christopher Arendt. He is now 24 and a half. And, and three quarters. And he served in Guantanamo Bay as a soldier uh, in 2004 at the age of 19 and he joined the Army and National Guard Reserves at the age of 17. Um, and he began this tour with me on the, officially on January the 11th in London where we had our first discussion together and this is the last date of our tour. <laughs> Chris. It's my way over. <laughs> Just somehow look at me while we're doing this. I know, this is the smallest table ever, though. <laughs> Chris, we've been doing this talk all of this time. You've been speaking about your experiences, sometimes in conversation with me, sometimes uh, just talking to people. We've gone to Edinburgh and Glasgow and Belfast and every other city I can think of in England. What are your impressions of the English people? 
They eat terrible food. <laughs> <laughs> Fry everything. Fry everything goes in oil first. It's okay. disgusting. That's more to do with us than with speak of it. Chris, what made you decide to come to the United Kingdom and talk about the things that you have with me? What, what was the catalyst that made you do that? Um, it was kind of a why not situation more than I, I, I don't know, the, the opportunity came up and I mean, <laughs> I was homeless at the time, so it's <laughs> not my, my options were not. Um, oh, you mean you've been wasting my time all this time? Yeah, <laughs> I'm just here for the meal ticket. Uh, and honestly, Chris, you joined the army at the age of 17 years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you went up to Guantanamo uh, when you were 19. What possessed you to go to Guantanamo? Why did you do that? Uh, well, I mean, I didn't, I didn't like wake up and I was like, I'm not, do you, you know what I'm going to do today? I'm going to go to Guantanamo Bay. Uh, I, I, was, I was forced to go because I was deployed. My unit was deployed. And at this point, at, at the time when you went to Guantanamo Bay, did you, had you ever met any of the other Muslims? What was your perception of them? Oh, no, no, no. I lived in a cornfield in, 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 <laughs> uh, in a single white trailer. I hadn't met any Muslims before in my life. Mm -hmm. And so they gave you this, they gave you this training. But before you did that, your, your, uh, your concept of, of joining the military, you, you joined the military for a purpose. What was, what was the purpose? It was, <coughs> Um, to go to school, did college money, um, mm -hmm. essentially a conscript. I, it, was, it was a business decision. Mm -hmm. And did you understand that at some point in your life you may well get activated into a full-time duty soldier and go off and fight wars or, or guard dangerous terrorists, terrorists like me and Omar? No, 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 I didn't understand that at all. I was, I was promised specifically the opposite when I joined. I mean, the National Guard is... Uh, essentially a domestic peacekeeping force, so the deployment seemed pretty ridiculous, but then other other units started to go. <laughs> First they came for the military police, and then they came for the truck drivers, and then they came for everybody else, and they, they, so they picked us up. And you trained as an artilleryman, yeah. right? Do you train in cannons and big guns and so forth? And so how did that how did that feel when you came to Guantanamo and got detainees? Uh, well, I mean, it was a pretty big transition, like, from going, I mean, I, like, I, I am totally, I, I, I'm so glad that I never fired a cannon. I mean, I've met so many mortarmen and artillerymen who actually did their jobs, and that's a nightmare that I would never want to, I would never want to have to wake up from, but, uh, I mean, still, it's, I mean, it was pretty, it was pretty silly, we weren't, I mean, we weren't even, I mean, we were a National Guard unit, we were a bunch of hillbillies, so, to see us down there, I mean, there was like, like maybe five full sets of teeth in the whole unit. I, 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 I'm the proud of one of them. Uh, and uh, we were just not, like, we were, we were not the kind of people that I would imagine that they would send down to, like, one of the most, you know, like, yeah. notorious secret. And have, having spoken with you for all three weeks and so forth, neither would I. <laughs> uh, but there you go. That, I mean, that's, that's one of the things that strikes me about you is that... Uh, you are, in a sense, not perhaps not typical, but you are certainly the type of soldier who is now fighting the war on terror, or being forced to fight the war on terror, and the types of soldiers I came across weren't too unlike you in the sense of somebody who joined the army so that they get the, uh, the college fees paid, perhaps get to go and see the world in the process. But you got to see Guantanamo, and you got to see us. What did they tell you about us? What did they say we were? Uh, they didn't take a whole lot of time to train us before we left. They, they, the only thing they told us was that, well, I mean, most of the telling that we got was from the TV from the time, the first time they flashed up the brown person after 9-11, and then, and then everybody, uh, you know, basically culturally trained like everybody else, that, you know, all Muslims were terrorists, and uh, then that Guantanamo was the place for the worst of the worst. So most of my training came from the media, and then... And then I, I mean, when we left, we didn't all we did, all we did was paperwork, paperwork, and uh, and then you know a, a couple of days of training on how to defend ourselves against toilet paper knives, and then we went to Cuba. So they didn't really tell us anything about who we were going to be dealing with, except that uh, you you guys would do everything you could to kill us. Yeah, with a toilet paper knife. Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. Toilet paper features a lot in your story, right? So let's get it out of the way right now. <laughs> what do you mean by toilet paper knife? I mean, explain. 
It's a knife made out of toilet paper. I can't. I don't know what else to say about it. <laughs> and, <laughs> Ridiculous. <laughs> and you were told that we as detainees uh, were adept at fashioning knives made out of toilet paper, which could hurt you. Skilled, skilled artisans. That you, you would, yeah, that you would, uh, that you would make toilet paper knives, uh, and that you would mercilessly kill us, all of us. Okay. <coughs> and and did you, did you, have you ever come across anybody who's been damaged by this sort of thing? I've never even seen a toilet paper. Knife. <laughs> I was there for almost a year, and I've never seen one single toilet paper knife in my whole life. Well, I, we tried to make one. I couldn't even make it. Because <laughs> you're not a good soldier. <laughs> Then, uh, of course, at some point, um, after your, your cultural training, after your, your training as, 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 uh, as a military policeman, as a guard, you eventually started walking what's known as the blocks where detainees were held in these cages that measured eight foot by six foot from 47 different countries in the world. What was your reaction? <laughs> uh, despair, anxiety, uh, I, I, just, I mean... Freaking out, really. I mean, it was it was a pretty horrible time in my life. No, I mean the bad things. Oh yeah, that's, uh, yeah. It was. I, I was. I definitely had a. I guess a negative reaction to it. Uh, it was. It's pretty. It's a pretty jarring thing to see. Uh, it's a really angry place. I mean, there was. There's a lot of tension there, especially between us and the detainees. Mm -hmm. And. What was your first encounter with any of this, the, the detainees, the prisoners? What, what was your first, the first time you had any interaction with one of them? Well, my first day on the block was on like the worst block, Oscar block. That's where the, the, the isolation block that they send everybody to when, uh, when they've, uh, you know, behaved poorly. And uh, the first, the only, the, the first detainee I ever talked to uh, was screaming and hollering for some toilet paper. And toilet paper again. Yeah. <laughs> it's it, Guantanamo is all about toilet paper. That's it. That's all. I will. I don't think I have all that much to tell you because for the, that entire time, all I was concerned about was toilet paper. Um, sorry, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So he he was begging for some toilet paper, and I so I, I got him some toilet paper, and then I was introduced to the to the only real legal process in Guantanamo Bay where. Uh, detainees are the lawyers, and the soldiers are the defendants, and the, the detainees know all the laws. Uh, all the rules, all the rules, yeah, yeah over the laws. Yeah, uh, and he kept telling me that I was that it was eight sheets. I, I, I was pretty positive that it was eight sheets of toilet paper, and then he, but he was dead set that it was three rolls around the hand. So we argued for a long time, and then finally I just gave him like a whole ball of toilet paper. But he grabbed my hand and pulled pulled me into the cell, and. Uh, I mean that, which was you know like so it's like my first first day and I'm, I'm like you know 19 years old. It's my first day on the block, and I'm in this like hot box, this you know solid steel bo like box, sweating sweat my ass off, and there's nobody else around me. They just let me go by myself, and then I'm I'm arm deep into a detaining cell, and I'm just like, what am I gonna do about this? What? <laughs> I don't have any. I don't know how to deal with the situation. Like I am. I just wanted to go to school, man. I'm sorry. Like, I don't want to do this. Like, I, I'm not. I, I'm sorry. You, you'd registered your protest to the to the, to the authorities. You'd already said before you went to Guantanamo Bay that you didn't want to go. Oh man, I said everything I could to get out of the deployment. I told them <laughs> I was manic depressed. I told them I was I, I was going to kill myself. I told them that I didn't like oppressing people and I didn't want to be an oppressor. I told them that I, I had a long drug history. I told them everything. I told them I did cocaine and mushrooms and mescaline and marijuana. <laughs> and then this is all written up on a paper. I mean, I was talking to a colonel, and she said, and I was, I was telling her every drug I'd ever done in my life. And then they still sent me down there. I don't know what you have to do to get out of these deployments. I tried everything I could. Maybe tell them you were a good soldier? Yeah. <laughs> um, Chris, then, you know, on to, on to a couple of things that, you know, and I think it's probably best to get it out of the way because it's, it, it's nonetheless an important issue regarding Guantanamo that people like to hear, although you, yourself and I have both said that we don't like to discuss it too much. People were brutalized in Guantanamo. I'm not spoken about it in detail. I, I experienced it, he experienced it, and so forth. We are all of the agreement that, uh, that the Guantanamo experience is something that should make us stronger looking back at, at the past. Nonetheless, some abuses did to play, take place. What did you? What was going through your mind when you saw some of these abuses, and 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 did you partake in it? 
Well, like you said, I mean, we, I don't really like talking about this, and that's mostly because this is the two sides one story, and my story isn't really a story of abuse, because I never, it, that wasn't really my, that wasn't, you know, like every soldier brought their own kind of story down there, and uh, I, I, you know, I, I didn't really participate in any of those things, uh, but I saw lots of it. I mean, I, I, you know, I saw people getting just excessively beaten, uh, and, uh, you know, just the, just every day down there is torture anyway, so, uh, it made, it made me, it made me sick, the, the, my uniform and who I was with and the people around me, I mean, I just totally lost faith in everything because I was not, like, I, you know, I, I joined the military and, like, uh, you know, every, every once in a while I, I kind of liked, I, I kind of liked being in the army, but then I had to look around me and all we were doing was all this sick all the sick shit everywhere in the whole world. Everybody, you know, we're, we're, every, every, if, if it wasn't Guantanamo where I had to do a whole bunch of terrible things, it would have been, would have been Iraq where I would have done more terrible things. So they just, I mean, it just made me disgusted with the whole, whole everything. People, the country, life, just period, that we're acting like this. You, in the United States military, have a, have a crime for soldiers, and it's called fraternization with the enemy. That means that's that's something that that, that uh, the, the soldier, the Vietnam vet, who told me about um, people marching in the streets against the war, he um, was told that he was fraternizing with the enemy and was sent away. You also were sent away from the main blocks operation onto um, DOC, which is direction or direct uh, detention operation. Detention operation center. Um, then you were involved in a process that's called the frequent. Flyer process. Can you explain to me how you were involved in that and, and what that meant? Well, the, the detention operation center was uh, where they stuck all the nerds. Um, because, with, I mean, the military is not the most intelligent group of people that have ever been organized. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they took everybody. And what about military intelligence? <laughs> non existent. Um, <laughs> Oxymoron. Yeah, that's. Uh, they took everybody out of the units that were. Uh, I mean, I don't want to sound. I don't want to sound like I'm bragging, and this isn't bragging. Being smart in the military is, is not that that big a deal. I mean, you don't have to be that smart to be smart in the military. Uh, but they took all the all the nerds, computer geeks, D and D players, and they put us all in the same office together, uh, and we ran the camp because nobody else could do it because it was kind of. You know, it's a it's a busy place, and there's a lot of papers, there's a lot of radios, there's a lot of everything that needs to be done all the time, and it, uh, so they put us in there, and then uh, they put me in the escort control office. Uh, so for 12 hours a day, for five or six days a week, uh, I would manage the movements of all the detainees in the camp by myself as a specialist. So I was. So I had like 40 people, 40 people usually outranking me every day, working working under my direct command, which was awkward. And uh, so I, I had to tell them what to do. So um, that meant I organized all the movements for interrogations. I sent out all the contractor escorts. Uh, and basically all this meant was I was just handing out papers and shackles and keys. and So you were take. actually running an escort agency? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's what I've always wanted to do with my life. And, uh, but the frequent pre- pre- yeah. I'm getting to it. I'm getting to it. <laughs> um, it's uh, it's the inter- when the interrogators have a detainee that they want to make sure is not sleeping. Uh, it's a form of sleep deprivation. They set they give me a list and they say that uh, say say you know detainee five ISN five five eight our our little inhuman number system we got going on five five eight needs to move from. Uh, Charlie 26 to Romeo 23 uh, every hour. So he'll go from Charlie 26 to Romeo 23, and then the next hour from Romeo 23 to Charlie 26, and then back and back, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, all day, every hour. What was the purpose of this? So that you can't sleep. I mean, a sh- to, to move is, I mean, you, you know, you gotta do the whole, like, hands through the bean hole, then you do the hand shackles and the belt, belt loop chain, and then, then the feet shackles. And then you got to shuffle all the way across the camp to wherever you're going, and then and then you got to undo that process the same way that you did it. So you know that takes 15 or 20 minutes. So 
then the detainees in their cell for 45 minutes before somebody's knocking on their door again to move them again. So they can't sleep. They spend their whole, they might spend months like this moving back, basically spending like three-fourths or, or one-fourth of their time, a quarter of their time, their life, uh, moving in between cells. You started recognizing early on what was taking place was cruel and human and so forth. Were there any other soldiers who, who were like-minded? And, and if not, how did people react to, to how you regarded the situation? Um, I mean, there were people... It was, it's a gradient. Like, there are people from all different kind of mentalities. Like, I hung out with these three guys, Dauber and Root and Duel, and we, we, we called ourselves Motorcycle Awesome, and we were just like a fake motorcycle gang. And we drank a lot together and hung out and had impromptu dance parties. Uh, and that's about it. But we, we kind of, we agreed, I, I, I was more extreme in my pacifism than belief that it was wrong, but we all agreed that what we were doing was pretty effed up, and uh, we all agreed that, uh, you know, there's no, that these people don't have any trials, and we have no idea what they've done, so, we, you know, like, our code of conduct was basically that we were going to be as pleasant and make this as easy a time as possible. And like especially Rooster, like he took it really seriously. He was a really he, he was a really good guy about uh, you know making sure that uh, he you know was a positive a asset to the detainees on the blocks and, and really held that in high regard. Uh, he never said that you know like even to this day we still disagree as to whether or not what we did down there was wrong. But uh, but he, you know like it's it's actions that count. He was he he he'd be very well. But for every Rooster, there's you know, 50 people that are, you know, are heinous and just ridiculous. Uh, you eventually completed your whole um, uh, tour in Guantanamo Bay. You uh, did that in 2004. You left the army, you were honorably discharged, you received commendations and, and medals and so forth, and then you joined the Iraq Veterans Against the War organization. Why did you do that? Um, well, I mean, at the time, I was, uh, I, I didn't, hadn't made any sense out of my life. I couldn't talk to anybody because I felt like every, I didn't understand anybody. They didn't understand me. I hated being in school. I, I left school because uh, all I saw around me were privileged kids that didn't have to do anything in their lives for anything, and I couldn't get Guantanamo out of my head, and I was just getting angry all the time. And <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I got up and walked out of so many classes just because some 18-year-old kid that has a free education ahead of them. And that, you know, granted, like, that's not, yeah, that's not a reason to, to hate anybody, but it just made me really angry, so... Was that because of Guantanamo? Yeah, that was just Guantanamo, military service, being poor, like, the life I came from and what I had to do, <laughs> and, and feeling like, you know, like, everybody else just sails through, like, why, you know, and so many people get stuck with just these crappy, crappy things in their lives, but... Uh, I, I heard about the, this group of veterans, and I was like, well, I mean, you know, I, I've, I've got to start dealing with this. You know, I've got to find some, some positive group and uh, some, some positive something. You know, like, I mean, my life was just really negative at the time. And, uh, so I found, I found an IBAW, and I, they, were just, they were just awesome. I mean, it was just the best. That, you know, they're to this day, like, a majority of my closest friends. Uh, when I contacted you about coming and the possibility to come to the UK to do this tour, you said that uh, in some talks that I want to describe to people what it's like to be a concentration camp guard. What did you mean by that? Uh, well, I think that people look at like the Nazi concentration camps and they think, like, how could those people do that? It's really easy. It's a simple thing. I mean, you make one decision and then you spend your, the rest of your life trying to explain that decision. I mean, I didn't I, it's not, you know, I, I, I barely made any choices in my life, and then I ended up working in a concentration camp. So when history unravels, you know, my name's going to be stamped on that camp, and, you know, that's going to be a pretty nasty thing, and I'm going to be dealing with that for a long time. And I just want people to know that it's, it's, it's a lot simpler than you think it is, you know. Like, it's, it, you, you wake up and you put your boots on and you go to work every day. It's just that you work in a concentration camp. But you did do something about it. You came here, you, you, before you came here, you started speaking out again about what you witnessed. You started speaking out against uh, the attitudes and the, the very concept of, of working in a concentration camp. And then you came to the United Kingdom. And you didn't just meet with me. You met with over 12 former Guantanamo detainees, including the one who pulled your arm into the cell um, after 
you, the toilet paper incident uh, occurred. How did that feel like? Oh, well, pretty weird. <laughs> so, it was definitely strange. Uh, I mean, the dinner, we met at dinner, it was great, and then we, uh, and then we went out for a drive, which was exciting, because he's got one arm and drives a stick shift and talks on the phone while he drives. <laughs> so, uh, so that, was, that was pretty wild. Um, but you, you got on very well. Huh? Yeah, I mean, he's, he's a pretty cool dude. You know, we come from similar-ish backgrounds, and yeah, it's, I, I mean, that's been the story with everybody I've met. Like, everybody's just been normal, and this has been, like, just totally regular, you know? I mean, and I was really apprehensive. I invited you to, to, to dinner with, you know, 12 former Guantanamo detainees, all of them, you know, much bigger than me. I'm not particularly huge. But, but those guys are. And I thought, this, you know, sort of skinny American is going to get wasted. Um, but that didn't happen, did it? No, no, no not really. No. <laughs> you probably got wasted from all the food you ate that night. Yeah, but that was a lot of food. <laughs> and so, you know, we're, we're, this is it. This is this is it. This is the end. This is over. After this, it is. You know, Chris goes back home. He goes back home uh, to the United States of America. But he's had this experience, this monumental new experience, touring the world, touring the, uh, uh, the UK uh, with former Guantanamo Bay detainees, with the worst of the worst. That's what we were called. Your president called us the worst of the worst. Now what do you think of us? Um, <laughs> well, it's, in, it's individual cases. It's hard to sum up. <laughs> uh, I don't. I, I mean, now, now you guys are kind of like I, I don't know, family, close friends. We've spent like a month in a car together. <laughs> uh, you know, like we've walked on the moors and we've done everything. We've walked on Hadrian's Wall together. Omar fell in the dirt. <laughs> I mean, we, we bashed conservatives on public television. I mean, we, we pretty much, if, if there's anything that two detainees, former detainees and a former guard could do together, we did it. So, mm. yeah, it's been, I, I mean, I don't know, I feel like it, I feel like you guys are just normal people. Like, uh, that's, the, that's the weirdest part to me is that... The weirdest part is that we're normal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that makes complete sense. Um, I've been speaking to... to, to uh, um, to you about this, and I think we should bring Omar in this, on this also, because Omar has told with his camera. Omar, Omar has told with Omar. Can you just tell me what have been your impressions of touring around the country with with uh, with Cr the likes of Chris? Yeah, it's been really nice, and uh, you can see we've been all over the place: museums, the War Museum, the Viking Museum, <laughs> and many places. Well, we we, we toured a we toured a, a prisoner of war museum together, yeah. um, which was bizarre. And it was <laughs> <several years. laughs> Yeah, so, so uh, what is what is it? What's it like? Yeah, it's been good. It's been really uh, nice to speak about many things, and uh, I think it helped it helped me myself. It helped me going on tour and speaking with Chris and getting to know him more. And so, it's been nice, uh, nice experience. One of the things that's come out of this, and I, I suppose we can I can speak to you all about, is that uh, Chris, through this, through his courageous move in coming here and speaking and speaking in the United States of America, has helped other former Guantanamo guards come out and speak and contact us and want to do the same thing and more. Chris was there in 2004, other guards were there in 2003, others in two, and others in, in, uh, in the other years from 2005 up until now. And each one of them would have had a, a unique role, a different experience, uh, a different take on things. So I think that what Chris has done here um, has helped to forge a new future. And this is new in the sense of, in the war on terror, you will not see people sitting together like this. This is an exclusive people. It's an exclusive. And I, I hope that you soak it in, and that you take from it, and try to benefit from it, and learn about the campaigns that we're involved in. Chris is part of the uh, Iraq uh, uh, Veterans Against the War. Please visit its website. Please uh, contact the people that are involved in it. It doesn't just affect Guantanamo. It's also about Iraq. It's also about Afghanistan. And it's about a mindset that you can help to shape and support them or not. Uh, visit the website of my organization, Cage Prisoners. We campaign for people detained without charge or without trial around the world. We've gone tunnel away, the secret detention sites in America, in Europe, and in this country here where people are held without charge and trial, either on extradition orders for 10 years plus, or people held on control orders 
uh, that are akin to house arrest, which you will not believe actually happened in the United Kingdom. And part of our tour also took us, myself, Chris and Omar, um, to visit some of these men detained in their own homes in the United Kingdom under anti-terror legislation. So please uh, support that, support our organizations and uh, visit the stalls at the back and uh, hopefully we can now open the questions. Apologies, I should have mentioned right at the beginning that Samuel Hajj uh, only got his visa to come to the UK today after, after having um, a tried and attempted for the past two months. They gave it him on the day of, his, um, of, of, of the end of this tour, so sadly he couldn't make it. Um, but it also, Sammy, uh, in the uh, true, risk, true sense of, of being a journalist, despite having returned from Guantanamo Bay for a very short time, uh, went to Gaza, uh, or attempted to go on in the first instance, and his ship, the Dignity, was rammed by an Israeli gunboat. Uh, he then went after uh, the invasion of Gaza and the killing that took place there, and today I just spoke to him, and the things that he said he saw there uh, broke his heart. Despite, this is a man who served six years in Guantanamo Bay, who saw his son, Muhammad, only after he was past the age of six years old. Why do you mention um, concentration camps? Because um, in the Second World War, concentration camps, there were six million Jews killed, and so they were given that small piece of years to live in. And I'm not going to be popular, I know, but um, I think that there was also rockets firing over into Israel from Gaza. And I'm not against you personally or anything, but I just feel there's two sides to have a story. But we sat here speaking uh, with, with the greatest respect for about one hour about Guantanamo Bay. And that's our experience. Yes. And, the, and it's called Two Sides, One Story. You want to know about two sides? You, do, is... you had an awful time in Guantan Guantanamo Bay, which was like a concentration camp. And other people have died in concentration camps. And I'm not doing one side or the other, I'm just saying the Israelis okay. now, did you want to go? I will just um, say that in relation to this, the issue about concentration camps, um, I went to a Jewish school as a child. I studied with Jewish children up until the age of 11. I celebrated Hanukkah, Pesach, Purim, Yom Kippur, and all of these festivals. But my best friends were Jewish. Some of them were children of people who had either survived the um, concentration camps or their parents had not. I also grew up to marry a Palestinian woman. And that woman, her parents were thrown out of their homes in 1948, has never been to Palestine, even though she holds on to the documents in the dream one day that she'll return to her home. So um, I think it's important for me, on, on a personal level, that when people talk about concentration camps, I think that the last people on, in the world to carry out the atrocities that we're seeing that are being done today in Gaza should be the descendants of people who were in those camps. Experience the same about the Jews, Jews, Jews people in London. There are just a, there's an organization that works very hard and campaigns very hard, and they're outspoken even against the atrocities that happen in Gaza. And they're Jews, so it's not a matter of uh, we hate Jews or something like that. The person. Um, in uh, response to the same question about what I think people can do, uh, granted, I'm 24 years old and I don't really know exactly what people can do to fix anything, but I believe very strongly that if people uh, just work harder at being better people and analyze themselves and make sure that th the things we're saying we're not doing the exact opposite or that we're not guilty of the things that we preach against and to be critical of ourselves and, and our societies and to part participate in our communities in a healthy way and to reduce your environmental impact on the planet and reduce the amount of money you spend, especially on oil. That would be a big one. Uh, I mean, I mean, just, just, I just, Make yourself a better person, and that's that's all that you can really do. I mean, you can participate in all of the different campaigns, 
in March, and those things definitely help, but, I mean, you're not helping the species or humanity if you're not, if you're not, like, self-checking yourself. And, uh, I'm still, I'm just still really weirded out by that question about profit. If I come here with a guitar to, like, be a rock star, I've been walked away with $10,000, like, nobody would criticize me for it, but I've been traveling for, uh, the last seven months out of a rucksack, uh, not asking money for anybody, uh, and doing this all just because this is what I love to do, and this is what I have a shot at, and I've never, ever been called out about that before, and I'm just, like... Super, super appalled. I, I mean, <laughs> yeah, just, just about the intelligence gathering, I wanted to say, because it's good to mention about how those consultation camps will not bring any, any, any viable, any uh, intelligence which is worthwhile. The example of uh, Ali al-Fahri, Sheikh al is a good example of that. Uh, he was tortured so badly and then taken to Egypt and forced to say things that weren't true about the Qaeda relationship with Saddam Hussein. And Bush relied on his, on these uh, allegations, on these uh, things that he confessed to under torture in Egypt. And he carried people to war in Iraq because of some of them relying heavily on those uh, confessions. Which, when he went back to Babylon to the United States uh, administration again, he said that was totally untrue. And the, the, the Americans, Bush at the time, recognized that was untrue. But still, the war continues in Iraq, and the, the, the results of it, everyone can see. You know, the deaths of civilians and children and women. Not Saddam Hussein, the dictator, which is gone, but rather people who were affected. Our women and children uh, there. Even us, when we were dragged to dragged to Guantanamo Bay, we were first dragged in Pakistan, tortured in Pakistan, in Islamabad, in Lahore for another another month. And then the intelligence gathering was really stupid. The first thing we were asked when we came to Guantanamo Bay is where is Osama bin Laden? As if Osama bin Laden is sitting down in internet cafes or something. Like that. <laughs> so what, kind of, what do you expect? What kind of gathering? What kind of intelligence gathering would you expect to get after seven years? Uh, seven years. People who are there now in the Taliban Bay have been in prison for seven years. What kind of intelligence about where it is about Saddam bin Laden after seven years? Even if he was in a certain place, he would have been moved by now. <laughs> <laughs> Are you ashamed of what your government does? Are you ashamed of your, to Chris? Yeah. Is he ashamed of the United States government action and does he condemn it? Um, I'm not really ashamed of them because I see our government as kind of an occupying force of a good piece of land uh, with a lot of good people on it and I'm, I, I, I'm not really of my government per se. I'm kind of done with them. Uh, so, I mean, no, I, I, I mean, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed of what they're doing. In, yeah, but yeah, so yes, I guess, but not so like, not ashamed action. of myself for them. You condemn but, their action. Uh, yeah, de definitely. That's why I I would just want to say in defense of Chris, but this does not mean he's a traitor to his country because there are many people, even in the States, who are against those torture camps and spoke against them. Lawyers, the CCR, there are many book, people who wrote books and so on. There are many people that he is not like feeling himself standing against his country or something, but he is against the government who, who took place at the time and did what it did to many, many people in Gaza, in, 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 in our concentration camp, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in many, many places around the world. They spent more than three trillion. I was then, I was last year, I was uh, two, two years ago, I heard about this when I was in prison. We heard from some from a lawyer, an American lawyer. All the American lawyers were allowed to come into those prisons, they were vetted. And he said to us that the spending on the Iraqi war came up to three trillion. I was shocked. I, 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 first thing, my reaction was asking people in the, in the camp, what was trillion? Because I never heard of the number trillion before, I heard of billions. Millions. I didn't know that trillion existed. This is the amount of money they, they spend on, on the war. Uh, so, yeah, they, I think 
people who must be ashamed as the people who did these acts, they should be ashamed of themselves. I think uh, um, it's important to recognize where we are at right now. That if, um, you know, if, if, if what Chris is saying is traitorous, then the greatest traitor story surely must be Obama because he's called for the close, he's now going to close Obama, Guantanamo Bay um, and said that the, the secret detention camps should be closed also. So this is a nation now finally coming to terms with um, the world's most notorious prison. Thank you, and I'd like you to show you some your appreciation to, to our panel and just a big round of applause. For the